Welcome to the second series of the podcast, The Magical World of G. Michael Vasey. This is G. Michael Vasey, and this is the first episode in that second series. And I'm rather pleased to be talking with Mark Stavish, the Director of Studies for the Institute of Hermetic Studies, a lifelong student of esotericism, with over 35 years' experience in comparative religion, philosophy, psychology, and mysticism, Mark and I have known each other for for quite a long time through Facebook and other social media platforms. I've read many of his books. I think he's maybe read one or or two of mine. And we've had some interesting discussions uh, on Facebook, but we've never actually spoken. Unfortunately, when we did, we got a couple of minutes in and then the internet crashed. So I'm going to start the interview with the resumption of that uh, interview after the crash, where basically I'd ask the question about the status of modern magic. Um, You know, the scope that we have to look at our lives against, but also our experiences as as a people. And, you know, we began to see a shift or a change back then in what was happening with esotericism and the movement to... uh, while a greater ex- discussion of the occult in the public arena, at the mm-hmm. same time, an occulture, as we like to call it, or as some people have also, I don't know who thinks they coined the phrase, I think we all do, but it means the discussing of the occult in a cultural context. But really what we mean is pop culture, you know, where you're wearing it on your T-shirt and, you know, and, and, yeah. every, and the symbols are everywhere, but they've lost their value. They've really lost any meaning. So this is talking about it in, in very hip and fashionable terms. And, and as you move forward now, and I talked about that as early as 2005, I wrote about the need to prepare for the time we're in now. 15 years ago, I was writing about it. You know, when I look back and I see what occultism has not done as a group, uh, I, at times I have to wonder, you know, what value it actually has beyond that of the individual's efforts. Uh, what what do you think it should have done? Well, the individuals should have at least been able to come together, formulate mm. some level of collective notion of their survival of their traditions and beliefs. Mm-hmm. And, and that just didn't happen for a lot of groups. And it's not that hard. It's not that difficult. You, know, you, well, just, have to, you just have to decide to do it and, and, and meet twice a month on a regular basis. You know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Some, something that, that that I've talked to with other guests are, is is the you know the, the fact that a lot of um, occult groups are the cult of the personality or become a cult of the personality, and that a lot of the personalities, uh, when you finally um, get to know them, are not actually particularly shining examples of what you might imagine them to be. At least that's been to some extent my sort of experience and i think uh, others have, have shared similar but uh, i find you know, a lot of the big time personalities are quite into themselves to be honest and it's not at all what you would expect and so maybe there's a, a little bit of the fact that in this line of business it's really easy to go off the rails and and uh, end up fooling yourself and any others as to what it is you're actually up to don't you think Oh, most definitely. But that's part of that's part of the maturation process. You know, when when you're doing something that's a value and and you're working on reflection and discernment, the first virtue of the path that we say of Mount Guth is discrimination. Yeah. You know, understanding that life is an if then statement. If I do this, then that. If I Mm -hmm. do that, then this. We are existing in a and this is where it gets really messy and, and where I've, I've given up really caring anymore who I might offend. But, you know, if we want to live in this wonderfully ambiguous, non-distinct uh, environment, pretending that we live in a non-binary world, then you're not going to get anywhere. I agree. Uh, and I'm with you on that one entirely. And it's, that this is, what confuses, is uh, another topic. <laughs> well, it's not because it's what confuses people's ability to discern. Yeah. It's not, you see, it's not another topic. That's the point, is that your your ability to understand that you live between two extremes. I had this conversation just the other day with somebody, as you do, a Facebook friend, and and they were talking about black and white. And I said, it's not black and white. It's not it's not evil and good. It's it it's two extremes and balance. And 
uh, they couldn't figure out for the life of them what I was talking about. And uh, I, I don't know. I, I suspect when I read your book and talked to you about egregores, I, I really, and, and I can never put this into words. It's just too much of a big idea. But it seems to me that whoever is behind society, whoever is driving it, is utilizing what I would call ma strong magical techniques, dark magic, using thought forms and, and so on to drive the masses in a particular direction. And, and as someone who tries to practice what he preaches, it drives me nuts that people can't see that. And, and they don't even believe in magic anyway. So let me pick up on that. You know, first of all, George Hansen's book, The Trickster and the Paranormal, it should be essential reading for anyone doing this work. I mean, he's the only person that worked in professionally in psychic research in, in the major labs in the 80s and, and still continues to have solid and strong connections in the, the communities that do research, uh, as well as the, the UFO communities, and uh, writes very critical literature about what is and is not happening. And his book, Trickster and the Paranormal, I think it's the only book he wrote, but you know, when you write one that good, you don't need to write two. So that, that's critical reading because he talks about what happens when things which are marginalized or a liminal that yeah. exist on the edges get pushed yeah. into the center of society or central life. And I've quoted his book at length in essays because we say, why, why is that people get involved in this? And often we see so many, so many of them come to a terrible end. And, and part of it is, well, lack of training, just lack of connection and tradition to be prepared for it. Because what happens is if you have that connection and tradition, now you expect things to happen. You have an mm -hmm. idea as to what's heads up. But if you want to go this alone like a cowboy and think that, oh, it's safe out there where there's, I don't have anything to worry about, well, you're going to have problems. And that's what happens. Now, let's extend that view. We now have this idea that whatever I believe is true. Okay. Yeah. We know that's relatively true because you will shape your actions and interpretations around that. However, and I think you and I had a, a lengthy dis discussion on Facebook about this. Yeah. Simply, simply as a matter of simply as a matter of logic. Yeah. Lo the logic goes this way: occultists, surprisingly, have decided many of the vocal ones, I should say, vocal, uh, you know, more public ones that there's no such thing as conspiracies. Every, you know, these so-called conspiracy theories aren't true. Therefore, theory means not true, means false. So we have some linguistic issues too, uh, that, you know, theory means theory. It doesn't mean it's proven false or it's make-believe. Yeah. So yeah. the occultists who fail to understand language, particularly as we discussed this on a Wednesday, the day of Her Mercury, the day of Hermes, the Lord of Words, is an important point. Language has meaning, and the manipulation of language and meaning. And I tell you this from you know having been a, a studying hypnosis and a practicing hypnotist uh, is very important, particularly in magical operations. So we're going to say there's no such thing as conspiracies. Well, that that assumes first of all absolute knowledge. And so they're telling you I have absolute knowledge and I know everything, and that's really what's being said there. Okay. So we see a constant violation of general semantics and general semantics says no problem can be solved by going to extremes, you know, all or nothing, personalizing it, making it about personalities or yourself or emotionalizing it. And because those are what we see as the most common logical fallacies in public discourse and private discourse today. I just want to set that framework as boring as it may sound. That's the problem. That's the context we have to understand it in. Mm -hmm. So I'm an occultist, and I believe that there is visible and invisible worlds and realities that traditionally, at least, there's vast hierarchies in these that go from the very dense down here to the very subtle and abstract, which are almost beyond my comprehension. And mm -hmm. that these hierarchies have a variety of beings in them, which we can say are good, evil, or indifferent, whatever, but that they are active not only in the invisible, but also influence the physical world. Now, how can you say that and then say there's no such thing as conspiracies? Because those invisible forces have to come into the physical world at some point. Yeah. And, and they have to do their whatever they do, whether you like 
it or not, agree with it or not, think it's good or evil or what have you. It happens in and through people. So right there, we see this tremendous break in logic. There's nowhere else to go after that. By the way, as you mentioned the book, I, I had to smile because on my desk right in front of me is The Trickster and the Paranormal by George P. Hansen. It's about mm -hmm. 500 pages long and I'm about a third of the way through it. I picked it up uh, not, not long ago as part of my reading uh, and I came to it, surprisingly enough, through the, um, the series Hellier. It's a, super, it's, it's a bunch of investigators um, investigating UFOs and uh, all kinds of other stuff, magic, uh, called Hellier. And um, has a lot, of, um, a lot of coincidences throughout the show that, that seem to occur. And I, I, every time I get on, one, start to record one of these, it seems it's filled with coincidences. So you mentioning the book that's actually on the desk right in front of me was sent shivers down my spine, to be honest. <laughs> Well, well, George, you sent me a, an email when his book was mentioned uh, a few months back or whatever it was last year sometime. So I'm familiar with the series and I, I watched a few of those episodes to, to see where they go. And and that's the other part that when we're dealing with magic. We're dealing with this several things. In fact, one is this notion of action in the world, which is what most folk magic is about. Most of the ritual magic that people are familiar with from the Renaissance is about However, there's other aspects of it which tend to be a bit more initiatic. And we think of those in terms of a modern approach to theurgy. Um, I don't think they're any more or less effective than traditional theurgy because so much everything works in and through us to begin with. I mean, we're, the, we're both the operator and the vessel and the material. So whatever methods we choose, uh, we have to work with what we've got. And ultimately, that's always us, ourselves. And that question of what is a initiatic process, and, and Jean de Bouis spoke a great deal about that. He, he was an extremely accomplished alchemist as well as operative uh, magician. And his focus was mostly that people need to uh, do their ritual work, or whatever magical meditative work, uh, to awaken within themselves or awaken their knowledge of themselves of some of the deepest levels of their potentiality, of their possibility. And... Yeah that that was most important. And, and the reason being is because if you do that, what you end up with is certain aspects of your life is simply becoming more harmonious. And this is what I've written about at length is what we see so many of the people in the magical community are, uh, they're simply rude and vulgar and crude. And uh, that's an aspect of the, what we call hod or that, that pillar of severity that they're, they're pinned to, uh, that they pillory themselves against. Life you know, needs that aspect of social uh, lubricant, that joy. And in the Renaissance, you see what is the key is eros, is love. And it's love on many levels. There's many aspects to love. It's not singularly romantic, but it's a powerful enchantment. In fact, uh, to enchant is the proper use of words. To, as we talked earlier, like in, in hypnosis or in magic, to entrain not just the thought, abstract intellectual fashion, but in a truly emotional fashion to the deepest recesses of the mind. And in that enchantment, that entrainment mm -hmm. is a, a magnetism. It is a magnetizing uh, possibility. It is a dominating force. Uh, that's why uh, eroticism is so powerful. And that is really the root and key of, of magic, uh, particularly from the Renaissance view. But we see in a more, in a more uh, common level, someone who has that powerful aspect of personality, that we would call them, is uh, somewhat socially pleasant to be around. That's the powers of NetSAC. Uh -huh, uh -huh. They're, they're socially pleasant. We enjoy being around them. And, and that we, we so find that we find that when someone has life happens more easily for them there's more coincidence because yeah. magic is about organizing coincidences yes yeah yes it's funny because i uh, i know when i'm in the stream as i call it because my life is is just coincidence after coincidence 
And I'm one of those people that a toe in and the rest of my body out of magic in reality. So that what happens is I, I go through periods where I'm really intensely magical. And then I get dragged into the material world of family and business and money and all that kind of stuff. And I go for months and months and months and suddenly wake up again and realize uh, I've lost all the coincidence. All the coincidence has gone from my life. I call that the magic. I, for me, it's a constant battle to stay tuned into what I call the stream. And what, what I've discovered, I think, is that for me anyway, the way to do it is to connect with the land. It's to be in the landscape. It's to be in the forest. It's to be in nature. It's to be with the goddess. And that seems to keep me con better connected. But I, I just feel like part of what we're talking about is, 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 is a weird dichotomy of the material world becoming even more material and dragging people away from, from their inner selves and, and magic. And at the same time being manipulated, I think, by whoever the, power, the, the, the earthly powers are, utilizing magical techniques of advertising and, and basically create creation of, of fear and, and all of that kind of stuff and driving behavior of the herd as opposed to the individual. And I don't know whether I'm making sense to you, but this, this is just the way I would try to explain it. Well, that's nothing new. All we do is we see it on steroids now with technology. Yes. Yeah. Techno technology has allowed us to do this on a level that's unprecedented. We were able to be here on this device, and we're roughly 4,000 miles apart, I guess, 4,000 oh, yeah. 4, miles apart, and communicating. So, too, do we have a technology that allows people to create their own magical worlds vis-a-vis um, -vis video games or, or something of that nature. So the... In enchantment the magnetizing of the imagination is what we do on ourselves through ritual and the magnetizing of the imagination is what we do on others if we wish to uh, get them to assist us in some manner and uh, the magnetizing of the imagination is what is attempted or done on us uh, in reverse and this is done through uh, a series of very basic fundamental knowledge. We can call it magic or psychology. It's irrelevant. Uh, yep. I'm not sure how much, and I say that because I'm not sure how much extra dimensional qualities are involved. And, and I say that like other spiritual entities. Uh, yep. I, I'm certain that a lot of these forces uh, or groups involved are conscious of extra human forces involved. They may or may not be, and that's irrelevant even to consider because as long as the fundamentals are present, it doesn't matter. We, we as individuals have to recognize what is happening to us and what we do to ourselves uh, across the day and, and formulate a direction for our own lives. And that means how we interact with one another, and but also our own self-image and self-talk. And this sounds so terribly boring and, and psychotherapeutic, but that is the foundation of it all. You yeah, just can't yeah. escape that. And, and modern occultism tries to escape that. They try to think that if they just read one more book on rituals, everything's going to work out. And mm -hmm. it's not, because you can only work with what you've got. Energy works, everything works in and through us. And I can't emphasize that enough. Yeah, and it's, as you said, it requires work. And some people don't necessarily want to put in the work. They, they do a lot of book reading, and um, they... they then go forward with that. Let me just give you an example. And I, I like these examples to be meaningful and critical and offensive because I want this to offend people's sensitivities because that's the only way you're going to start realizing what you have to focus on. I wrote about two weeks ago or so uh, some lengthy posts on explaining, you know, not taking a position, not saying something did or did not happen but explaining to people why, if you were living in Pennsylvania, why, especially where I'm at, northeastern Pennsylvania, we are the pin in the hinge of the swing state right here. If you told me there was, there was election fraud, why, I wouldn't hesitate to believe you. And I wrote about why that is, the history of it, the history of massive corruption. I posted articles to show... I'm not making this stuff up. But people didn't want to believe it. They took offense to it. I said, you have no, no yeah. idea what's going on. 
You only hear what you want to hear. You yep. only get filtered through you. I am telling you someone who knows the area intimately, who met these people. I've been in rooms with them. Okay. I'm trying to tell you friends of mine know what goes on. Okay. We, we, we have been in the meetings. Okay. They just don't want to hear it. Now, these are the people no. who are supposedly on the path and seeking truth, but their, their true view, their true religion is some naive notion of liberal politics, progressive politics. So yep. when, when I put in front of them, not take, I'm not saying it did happen. I'm not saying, but I'm saying, I mean, the joke around here is quite honestly, if there's an election, it's not a mat matter of whether there was fraud. It's just a matter of how much fraud. And I think that should have some meaning to people listening. You know, that's that's <laughs> coming from the inside view. I mean, when when a Monsignor of the Catholic Church, whose brother happened to be like the owner of MCI, by the way, telecommunications, publicly jokes about having gone up to the to to vote and says and, and the response is, well, well, I'm sorry, Father, it appears you've already voted. Uh, when that gets when that gets laughs at the rubber chicken dinners, that should be telling you something that how, oh, how widespread this is to give you an example of this is what contemporary occultism. This is the this is the elephant in the room of contemporary spiritual practice. I mean, I agree. It it's over into all the areas that I the, totally agree. Unwillingness to really accept incredibly painful and unpalatable truths about reality. But um, I've been saying exactly the same thing over the last uh, several weeks, which is, look, I, I spent almost 20 years in the state of Texas. Everybody in that state knows that every election is absolutely filled with fraud. Dead people voting, people with no IDs, votes showing up in the back of vans. Everybody knows this. So how come in 2020 that didn't happen? Are you kidding me? You're, you're simply deceiving yourself. You know. Johnson got to be president. That's how he got his senatorial seat. 200 yeah. votes mysteriously showed up, all for him, swung the election. It went to court. The judges said to the, to the loser, doesn't matter. He becomes a senator. Uh, shortly thereafter, he becomes vice president. And, of course, we know the rest is history. I suspect cheating goes on on both sides, and I don't. I, I don't think we will ever really know whoever won, who, which side won. But to say, and to spread the word as gospel that no underhand subterfuge took place. This was a pristine election. Is <laughs> just yes, it's funny, isn't it? And yet, that's the argument. And and if you know, this is the kind of reality these people are working for. One in which. What they want to see exists and what they don't want to see gets brushed under the table. And I live in a part of the world where, and, and this is the other thing that sometimes you know, frustrates me a little bit, is I live in a part of the world now where a totalitarian system existed. And when, when I uh, tell people, well, you know, um, I, I begin to see some parallels here, that there's a... There's a well, this is what happened in communist Czechoslovakia. And the next thing was, you know, your kids reported you for saying things that were against the, the doctrine. And the next thing you knew, you're dragged off to jail or re-education facilities. I mean, when people laugh at me when I say this, but um, <laughs> it's interesting because I was going to ask you as well why it is that all the new age stuff is it ends up being so airy-fairy and... Um, cute when people tell me but gary you know we're, we're killing the planet and we're a virus i'm i'm saying well have you heard of flesh-eating bacteria and have you ever seen a volcano go off when a deer has its throat ripped out by a lion nature is two-sided nature is is vicious and unforgiving and cold at times well, as well. well that's why i mean you have to understand that various systems occur within a cultural context and the, the, the cultural context of, of contemporary spirituality, I mean, it's like I, I have an extensive background in Vajrayana. And, you know, I often call, I'd even call a lot of the teachers on, on things they'd say that w were not accurate historically, because they were constantly creating a context for experience, not necessarily concerned with historical accuracy. And that's an important point there. However, the, the point is that they would water down their teachings 
because the stuff that goes on in Tibetan Buddhism and particularly some of the practices is is completely unpalatable to to the Western pocketbook. And that's that's an aspect that is ignored regularly. And it goes on with all of these practices that, you know, when you when you undertake a, a, a spiritual practice, it's within the framework of where you are right here and now. And many people are very happy with who they are. They're very comfortable with themselves. And and all they want to do is uh, have a better glimpse of reality uh, or what they think reality is or, or learn how to get more of this or that. And that's fine. Traditional magic was about that, too. You know, keeping the fires away and increasing your flock and and uh, mm-hmm. find boyfriends so that and winning at war. Uh, so that's OK. However, when you live in a highly civilized technological society, your connection to the realities of nature and we'll call that consequences, again, discernment or uh, or uh, uh, discrimination, if then, the if then statements get dramatically reduced. You know, because, you know, if you do something and it doesn't have a negative impact on you, particularly when that's life threatening, there is a tendency to believe that uh, it doesn't matter. So we see a, a tremendous amount of idealism. Now, some of this does have to do with the long march through the institutions uh, from the 50s. Well, actually earlier from the 30s, really. But really, we saw it explode in the 60s and 70s of just the, the massive amount of uh, anti-establishment, both legitimate and and seditious, okay, within the mm-hmm. American institutional structures, and and that's where people don't want to understand it too. Yes, there was legitimate concern over American foreign policy and domestic activity. Yes, that had to be addressed. But let's not pretend the KGB wasn't funding a lot of stuff too. Yeah. Okay. And I see that with places where people work too that I know. Who are where it's the Chinese now instead with all these free trips to China? Yeah. I mean, there's a reason they take teachers. You know, they, they're not they're not, not just give, they're not giving free trips to me. My, my point is is that these ideas were behind the human potential movement of the 60s and 70s. Human potential movement is part of what gave birth to the New Age movement, which was essentially we can create utopia extension of a communist ideal it's an extension of the judeo-christian new jerusalem ideal we can create utopia because if the power of the mind is such all we have to do is get everyone involved well i worked in social services for a very long time and i can tell you just because you tell someone or point someone in a good direction does not mean they're going to walk that and (laughs) and and quite frankly nice quaint white middle class people don't want to understand that because again it's a hard reality and it's a hard truth so when we push that even further down the road and by that i mean into the 80s into the 90s into the 2000s where we're at now we're seeing a continuation of several streams of thought all of them very idealistic and utopian in nature which is this belief and and that we can alleviate all human suffering with some kumbaya can't we all get along However, that requires that everyone cooperate and have the same value structure. And that is antithetical to the other thing which is brought in, which is multiculturalism. Um, if you if you are a practitioner of magic, then one of the attributes that I look for is discernment, the ability to, to deconstruct things and, and see an honest, clear picture. And the removal of of the ego and the removal of the lenses that we look at the world through the ones we were taught at school, the ones that our parents taught us that we've, that we've taught ourselves is, is a part of the process of, of tearing yourself down and and kind of putting yourself back together again. And it seems to me, and this is the topic I meant we couldn't really uh, go go too too much further in because of time. But if you really practice magic, if you really practice the kind of what I understand to be magic and what I think you're also saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, would, would mean that if you really practice this, then you wouldn't tolerate fraud in any election. It doesn't matter who, which political party you, you or how offensive you find the leader at the time. You simply wouldn't tolerate it from either side. You would because it's it's not true. It's not it's not it's not it's not the, the truth that we have trained ourselves to seek. Does that make sense? Well, it's, well, that's it. It's not actuality. It's not the yeah. reality as it is. And yeah. but the reason you were not seeing that is because the idealism 
that I talked about that I was trying to outline for us in terms of a yeah. cultural phenomena, that cultural phenomena of that idealism is so ingrained and so massive and that it's, you know, it is the it is the moving force behind most of the mainstream religions, even, you know, that it is so big that trying to get people to understand how simply brutal life can really be and magic too because magic is right. life and they don't yeah. want to you know that's that's where we get into another topic is a total affront to their understanding of reality and that creates a kind of post-traumatic stress disorder what many people don't ever recover from and i see this frequently with people where they they suddenly realize well they get mugged i've seen this with people who get mugged quite physically, literally mugged, that the, the reality of the physical trauma, the, the reality of the psych you know, uh, is so much psychologically, it, it degrades and breaks up so much of their understanding of who they are and their relationship to people around them and mm -hmm. strangers that they can't handle it. And I've seen that often. I've seen it in other ways, in different ways. Again, having as a therapist, having worked as a therapist. And, and, and what we do is we, we talk about initiation Initiation is a controlled trauma. First of all, magical ritual is a is a self-controlled psychotic event in which you, you know, the, the joke is neurotics build castles in the sky and psychotics live in them. And when we're doing this visualization, I mean, we're essentially building our castles in the sky, so to speak. So it's kind of a, yep. a controlled psychosis. Uh, on the other hand, uh, a true initiation is a breakthrough, which means something has to break down. Yeah. So it's, it's a traumatic event. And the other one is going back to George Hansen's book, uh, Trickster and the Paranormal, the destabilizing effect of when we push too much of this into the center, center stage of, of either society or our own lives, is that all occult practice are, are inherently destabilizing. They have to be because you're talking about change on some level. So you can't change things unless you first destabilize them. The question is then, how well do they restabilize or reintegrate after that is done? And this happens both to us individually. It happens within whatever groups we're working in. We see this, and the groups don't have to be magical, by the way. They can be family. They can be uh, yeah. business. They can be societal. And, and this is what we're looking at. We're saying, okay, now, if you want this, then this is what has to happen. And things don't always move. Sometimes they do, but they don't always move as smoothly as we'd like especially when you have a lot of moving parts. The more moving parts you've got, the greater chances you'll have of friction and things breaking down. And within us, we have many moving parts in terms of the aspects of our psyche. Within society, we have many moving parts in terms of the people and the entities involved. Um, so I'm trying to keep it in that, that framework where we can see that it's, it's not as easy as people think. And, and right, seeing reality, saying, I want to know the truth, regardless of how difficult or painful it is or how much it uh, offends my sensitivities or preferred notion of how reality should be. You notice the moral imperative should be yeah. rather than as it is. That's a difficult one. Again, the, the way I try to deal with stuff is is there isn't a, an absolute right and there is an absolute wrong. There's, there's, there's two extremes and there's the middle ground. And that unfortunately, the middle ground is always shifting, of course. So it's it, once you've found it, staying with it is difficult but um i always try to look for the middle ground i mean i'm not great at it myself but uh, that's what i try to do i always try to find the middle ground well you have a certain advantage uh that you know is and this is going to be maybe offensive to some of your listeners but i've had many many an alchemist say this to me and so i'll share it you know there's just too many social workers therapists and artists in in modern occultism particularly magic, because magic is a form of drama. It's a form of performance art in, in that way, ritually. Yeah. And, you know, we you, you need people who have a, a training in science and the sciences, particularly in alchemy, uh, because it's dangerous. It's physically dangerous. You can kill yourself. I mean, uh, uh, Israel Regardi injured his lungs. He was very skilled in the lab, and he injured himself twice with antimony. You know? uh -huh. So we have to keep that in mind. You know, the, the rounding out of the personality uh, in, in many ways is extremely important. And that means understanding, you know, what is the scientific method? Uh, what does it mean when we say uh, a theory? 
you know, uh, what does it mean when we're uh, talking about process of experimentation and collecting of data? Because we unfortunately do that- all of all of this is being politicized as we speak, and it's very frustrating to those of us that that appreciate what the scientific method really is, and also appreciate that science is about hypotheses. You, you were talking about theories. Science is about creating theories and then and then testing them through prediction and through debate. And as soon as you decide that a particular theory is the politically expedient way that results in something you desire, then your politi- your um, politicization of science has, has resulted in religion. And um, I find that pretty offensive, quite honestly. And I, it's been used in climate science. It's being used been used in all kinds of. Uh, I think I think the the way it was used in climate science was so effective that the people behind it now utilize the same approach and methodology in everything going forward. Oh, I, anyway. I, I believe I believe so. And and therein lies the problem because. Now we we have a, this goes back to the idealism I was talking about with the long march and and the idealism we see in in uh, that that gets picked up on in in new age thought in in social issues the idea of utopianism that the out the the goal is so perfect and so I, I per idealistic that how can you be against it therefore any action to achieve that goal is acceptable yes yeah and it doesn't that, because that is that goal is the ultimate truth. Well, it, but it apply, and it applies to what we're talking about in terms of esotericism, because yes. as you ha- as you have interior experiences, you, they're difficult, and you have to begin to learn how to process them, and you have to be open to possibilities of being wrong in your processing, because you have other filters. So you have to be very patient. That's the operative word, patient, and accumulate more and more data. What's that data? Experience, and look for commonalities and connectivity. Uh, and find that realization, begin to learn to trust yourself, trust your experience, trust that uh, as you move forward into that inner voice. And uh, with that comes silence, you know, learning how to just be quiet. And that and silence doesn't mean just learning how to listen. It means how to keep your mouth shut so that you're not blabbering all over Facebook about your your your, your latest dream that you've had or, or what ritual you plan to undertake and asking strangers for per- help with it. You know, the, the, the lack of discrimination, again, uh, is, is, pro- is the single greatest obstacle to people making progress in any activity, any activity, and particularly uh, in contemporary spirituality. Great place to stop because we're on the hour mark. And uh, so uh, just, just to finish out, if, if uh, people were interested in finding out more about Mark Stavish and your activities and, and the things that you're up to, where would they go to, Mark? Well, they just go to Google and Google Institute for Hermetic Studies. We have a website, hermeticinstitute.org, but Institute for Hermetic Studies. You're going to see our, uh, our blog, Vox Hermes, will pop up. Uh, that's at WordPress. Uh, of course, we've got several YouTube pages, different ones that are different from my personal page. Uh, that They just list exclusively activities and, and things that we do. Uh, we've got a complete course set up at teachable.com. So Hermet Institute for Hermetic Studies at Teachable. And of course, if they find any of these, there will be a link to an email address and they can email me or someone else uh, will, I or someone else will answer that email and uh, get them information on our course, our coursework and our activities. <laughs> Well, my thanks to Mark Stavish for being with us today, and my thanks to you for listening. We hope that you found it informative and of interest. If you'd like to learn more about Mark Stavish or or the Institute for Hermetic Studies, please consult the notes below this podcast. Please do also subscribe to it and like the podcast if you feel that's appropriate. And I hope that you'll join me, G. Michael Vasey, on another podcast in the near future. We've got many other interviews coming up, and I'll also do a couple of solo type podcasts as well in this second series which i'm really looking forward to thank you again thank you to mark and goodbye